Good morning. Good morning. The Tuesday, October 5th, 2021, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now be called to order. We'll begin with a moment of silent reflection for the first responders and members of our armed forces, followed by an invocation by Pastor Jeremy Redman from the First United Methodist Church, and Commissioner Laura Moss will lead us in the pledge. Please rise. They already have. God, we come before you with gratitude this morning. We know that you've given us the gift of life, and your blessings are too many to, to name, but we, we do want to come before you and, and share some specific words of gratitude, Lord, for, for this great nation in which uh, we get to live, for the United States of America, for, Lord, the fact that we get to live in such a beautiful state in Florida and even in what must be the best county in uh, in the state of florida we thank you for indian river county we thank you for the blessing that this is our home and god we'd like to lift up a prayer of gratitude for all of those who make it possible for us to live in such a beautiful and well-ordered and peaceful and loving uh, lord society we we lift up uh, our military to you we acknowledge with gratitude all those who have fought and bled and died so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we do. We lift up to you, Lord, our first responders. We lift up uh, our medical folks, Lord, that help us and we're so mindful in this time for how they serve us. And we, Lord, continue to pray for our community. We pray for health, we pray for prosperity, and most of all, we pray for righteousness and love. Lord, we'd like to lift up uh, this, this meeting of uh, the county commission and all of our commissioners. We pray that you would bless them as they serve us and lead us. God, would you bless them and their families? And would you bless these proceedings that all that happens here would be for the good of your people? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Um, you know, this, this past Sunday, October 3rd, was Fallen Firefighters Memorial Day, so I'd like to say a special thank you to our fire and rescue for all the important work they do, um, especially during COVID uh, at the fairgrounds. They were incredible. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. At this time, is there any uh, additions, deletions to the agenda, any emergency items, commissioners? Seeing none. Move to approve agenda as presented. Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. First off, we have a presentation of proclamation recognizing the month of October 2021 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I do have the honors, so, and we have a large group of dedicated individuals, so please come on up. And I'll be happy to present this, and then we're going to hear some great things. Do you want to come up here? No, no, yeah. stay right, right there for now. Thank you. <laughs> this way we can hear you from the, Good. From the microphone. Thank you. This proclamation recognizing the month of October 2021 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, whereas each day in America, four women are murdered by their intimate partners, and whereas each day in America, an average of 20 people every minute are abused by their intimate partners. And whereas one in three American women and one in four men have experienced some form of intimate partner violence. Whereas National Domestic Violence Awareness provides all Americans with the opportunity to recommit to ensuring that every relationship being violence free. Whereas in E. River County, 
Safe Space Incorporated joins forces with law enforcement, victim services programs, criminal justice officials, social service organizations, and concerned citizens to fight the domestic violence and provide all domestic violence victims a safe place where they can live with respect, resources, restoration, and justice. Together, their commitment and compassion help to ensure that our community steps forward to support domestic violence victims in need. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indy River County that the Board recognizes the month of October 2021 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month and the advocates for the relationships rooted in trust, respect, and equality and expresses our sincere appreciation for those committed to promoting peace and preventing domestic violence in our community. Duly adopted this fifth day of October 2021, signed by all five county commissioners. You have to re reading that and seeing how many, how many groups and organizations that have to be involved, have to be involved for the awareness, for the understanding and all that you do. And we still have situations that need to be addressed. And we, we truly appreciate all that you do in the name of domestic violence. I said, we're gonna hear some great things. And that's an awkward statement to make when we're talking about domestic violence. But the greatness comes from you and all of the individuals that have collectively said enough is enough and we are going to address and comfort and care for those who are exposed to domestic violence. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Safe Space staff members, board directors, and most importantly, the victims of domestic violence and their children whom we serve every single day, I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County for recognizing October as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I wish I was here today to tell you that the incidence of domestic violence in this beautiful paradise that we all call home has been decreasing. We must recognize that a domestic violence pandemic has fraught this country before the COVID-19 outbreak. This public health issue has only exacerbated even more the incidence of intimate partner violence. We should not and cannot remain silent about how members of our communities are being impacted by these criminal acts. During fiscal year 2021, Safe Space provided services to 178 residents of Indian River County, consistent of 151 women and 27 children. These individuals received close to 1,800 outreach services from our advocates. Given the rise in the number of victims of intimate partner violence from Indian River County, we decided to launch an initiative to open an emergency shelter in the property that we own here in Indian River. With the assistance of the Jones Island Foundation, the Indian River Community Foundation, Impact 100 Indian River, Jones Island Community Service League, and the Indian River Club, Safe Space will expand its services in Indian River and open this emergency shelter in January of 2022. We believe it's time to stop the silence and openly address the overall impact that domestic violence has on our society and how we should address this historically taboo subject. In addition to the obvious humanistic and psychological impact on the victims, there is also an enormous economic impact on society from domestic abuse. We estimate that the cost of domestic violence in Indian River County alone amounts to more than $12 million annually. This estimate considers the number of domestic violence incidents reported by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the associated medical costs that these victims receive, the mental health services offered, loss of employer productivity, and law enforcement costs. This is no surprise when we consider that one in three women and one in four men have been victims of domestic abuse. 
that nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. 20 people per minute every single day. That four women are murdered by their intimate partners every day. And one study found that children exposed to violence in the home were 15 times more likely to be physically and are sexually assaulted than the national average. I believe that we would all agree that violence is wrong and that, we must, and that it must be prosecuted accordingly. Not only are the direct victims impacted, but also family members, the taxpayers, the economy, and the smallest and most vulnerable are children. Domestic violence is a serious national, societal, and economic issue that everyone has a role in eradicating. Often witnesses to domestic abuse are afraid to speak up or get involved. I therefore ask that each one of us here today do our best to talk about this very serious issue. Please join us this Saturday, October 9th, at Humiston Park as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of Safe Space Walk a Mile in Her Shoes, an activity that helps raise awareness about the seriousness of this malady that is intimate partner violence. Let's unite as we ratify our commitment to the victims of domestic abuse and their children that they are not invisible, that life can be different, that it is not too late, and that safe space programs and services are here to end life free from violence. Thank you for your support and for this proclamation today. Thank you for all, all that you do. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, a very complicated uh, operation to run and to secure and to supply. And there's a lot of folks that uh, would like to help uh, and, and do something for your mission. Uh, I found out I, for years, uh, my dad used to collect uh, shampoos and <laughs> toothpaste, and I, I had no idea, uh, and this when I was a deputy, in which I knew where we were uh, with Safe Space, and uh, we, we were talking, and, and I said, geez, you got a box of stuff? He said, why bring that to Safe Space? and he would collect it in the community. And there's a lot of folks that want to do that. And I, I realize, you know, we don't need them to bring it to a location. So could you announce where people can do that? Because there's, there's a lot of generosity in our community and a lot of people that may not be able to afford to uh, supply the funding, but they sure do have a lot of supplies and, and things that you may need uh, to uh, keep the operation running. Right. And so we are now establishing a relationship and a partnership with the Up Center, where we're going to be actually renting some office space away from our undisclosed location so that our advocates can provide services where our facilities are under renovation and where we can accept donations to support the work that we'll be doing in the emergency shelter. That's, and that's why I brought it up, because it, since it's an undisclosed location, you yes. can't just say, but just stop by and drop it off. Yes. And it's always been a difficulty to, to get there. So you were going to have a, a location that they can drop off stuff and assist in yes. any way they can? In the Ops Center. United yes. Against Poverty. Uh, that's where we're going to be establishing an Pardon. office during the next month to begin that process. Great addition. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You have a, a, a group with you today. And yes, I, I, I do. So I want to introduce Erika Snowberger, member of the board of directors of Safe Space, Linda Hanger, member of the board and chair of the governance committee, Amy Cooper, member of the board and president elect of the board of directors of Safe Space. And over here we have Jamie Bellamy, our development manager. Outstanding. Yeah. Um, two things. One, um, ladies, the first thing might be a little bit personal, but um, are all of you vaccinated? Yes. Okay. Would you mind taking your mask off? Because when I hear you say hear our voice and you're masked up, 
the, the vision I get is, no, you're being muzzled, you're being held quiet, you're being held back, and I want to hear your voice, and I want to see your voice, and all that. So I think, for me, the image I want to see is no mask. So we can hear your voice in your message. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, secondly, years ago, I was um, on one of the United Way um, committees that went and evaluated the, the different recipients of their programs. And one of the ones we were assigned to was Safe Space. And we were all loaded in a van to go to the location. And they didn't quite blindfold us and put black bags <laughs> on our head, but we were sworn to secrecy for the location. And um, commissioners, if you ever get a chance, it, it, it was very impressive just how the whole um, kind of campus was laid out, the, the various programs you have um, for, the, for the people in there, and um, just how it seemed like such a calm, safe setting. You know, and I could see how the, uh, the women that go there seeking help would um, um, feel, I wouldn't say maybe relaxed, but they would feel safe there. You know, they knew they were protected. They knew there was people looking after them. And uh, so very impressive. So um, thank you for all the work you're doing with that. I think it, it's a huge difference in the community. So thank you for that. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies, thank you for what you do. As uh, Vice Chairman just said, I, I, it's been five years now or so, but I had the uh, opportunity to to uh, visit the facility on a, in, in a professional manner when things were probably at their worst and you guys stepped in and you, and you, uh, you know, saved a potential uh, someone possibly losing their life. So I've, so I've seen it firsthand, I'm sure, as, as the chairman has also. And uh, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Sure. No, um, you guys have been a great resource in the community. Um, I know uh, my community in North County, uh, the, just having you guys available, I'm very happy to hear that you'll be having an emergency shelter located back in Indian River County. I know for multiple different reasons um, that had, had, was different several years ago. So kudos to you guys for doing what you have had to do to make that happen. I think it will be very beneficial um, one of the concerns, you know, that, that women have when things like this arise, and it's not just the women, I, I know there's men as well that partake in your program, is being further away from their community and from their families if there's children involved, make, taking them outside of the county um, where they are not able to attend the same schools. Um, it has ripple effects through those relationships, and it has ripple effects in their decision-making process to get out of a bad situation to get themselves somewhere where they are safe. There's so many things that go into whether they are, are able, have the strength and have the support system to make that decision. So I'm really happy to hear that you'll be coming back um, and providing that to the community. Um, you guys do a great job. And as always, we're very happy to support you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very glad that you're here today. Domestic uh, violence is such a difficult topic to talk about. But I do, I do get calls, I, I get some emails, I just had some the end of last week. And you know, you, you talk to, and it's mostly women that I've talked to in my case, and I, I know that there are men who, who are victims at times as well. But you talk to them and you want to be able to offer them something and there really hasn't been that much. So I'm, I'm very thankful that you will be opening um, a place for them in January. I think that will be a huge help. And as Commissioner Adams just mentioned, we're, then we're not taking them away from their neighbors, their friends, their, their social network, their, their support. Um, so thank you so much, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies. Uh, if there's uh, anything else that we can do uh, please don't hesitate, bring it on back because, uh, and I'm very encouraged that you will have a location. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Airman uh, brought up we would be no strangers to the, uh, uh, the occurrence, yes, because in, in law enforcement, you're drawn right into it. And I do remember, uh, just want a couple, two stories with uh, 
as far as the blindfold and the, and the, <laughs> the windows and, you know, even deputies didn't know where to go. Yeah. Uh, it was, well, just go down this street and dispatch would tell us where to go. And uh, it was, and it was so much limited resources that at the time, uh, going back to about 2002, there was uh, some limited resource or shallow time where we actually went out to uh, the area hotels. There was only about five of them. At this point, we worked, my partner and I worked a cooperative with them, and now on a rotational basis, they would afford two, two or three room night stays in order to uh, cool off the situation until we can get to better resources because there were, weren't many resources, and there was a challenge then. There was recently a challenge, and now we're going to have another facility. We look forward to that. I know there'll be no big ribbon cutting or ceremony, but just to know, it's very comforting to know that there will be a place that will be a safe place. We'll do a symbolic ribbon cutting in a proper location that we identify, but you'll be all invited to that event when we open our emergency Thank shelter. Thank you. Maybe we could do the ribbon cutting here just there to say go. it's yeah. there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, uh, I guess... Uh, we need to take a walk. We, look, yeah. yeah, everybody want to take a walk? I think maybe towards the back where there's room for the pitcher with them where we can see the shoes and stuff. Are you going to ask to do a kick step too? No, no, I'm just, <laughs> but I'm willing to walk that, that far. Bonus. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, Mr. Administrator, if I break my ankle, are we covered? <laughs> okay. <laughs> just walk carefully. Did you get them on? Yeah, bring it, bring it. I don't know how well I'll do. Look at that! <laughs> yeah, be careful, I don't do too much. I know. Stop too, showing off. Too, too confident there. Found respect. Well, you know what? I'll just walk on back. Yeah. No, I got it. No. <laughs> Made it. <laughs>
Folks, excuse us a minute while we change our attire. Somehow I didn't get attached. It's okay. I thought I would, but no. You knew them for Saturday. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I'm trying. I don't want to didn't want to go in. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Is this everybody? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Okay, we're all collected. Thank you. Well, the next item is a presentation proclamation designating October 2021 as Manufacturing Month in Inner River County, Florida. And our Vice Chairman, Peter O'Brien, will have the honors of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we have Helene Castletine and Dory Stone from the Chamber here, as well as various representatives from our manufacturing family here in the county. And... Um, Helene, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation and then let you introduce everybody. If everybody wants to say a hey, that'd be great. Okay? Awesome. <clears throat> Designating October 2021 as Manufacturing Month in Indian River County, Florida. Whereas October 1st, 2021 is National Marketing Day, the kickoff to, man um, not marketing, Manufacturing Day, the kickoff to Manufacturing Month, recognizing the manufacturing industry as vital to the health of our county, the state of Florida, and our entire nation. And whereas manufacturing is one of the cornerstones of our local economy, helping to sustain our quality of life, as well as foster a solid and diversified tax base in Indian River County. And whereas, as our local, state, and national economies continue to recover from the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, a healthy and sustainable economy is crucial to these efforts. And whereas manufacturing provides 2,280 high wage and high skilled jobs in Indian River County with 134 manufacturing firms paying an average annual wage of $51,500 higher than our current average wage of 43,900. And whereas we join the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce, the Treasure Coast Manufacturers Association, local educators, and the many volunteers in supporting the Manufacturing Boot Camp Program, encouraging students and young adults to consider manufacturing as a career pathway. And whereas all residents are encouraged to take time to acknowledge Indian River County manufacturers and their employees for the positive economic impact they have in our county, the state of Florida, and our nation. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the month of October 2021 be designated as Manufacturing Month in Indian River County. Adopted this fifth day of October 2021, endorsed by all five county commissioners. Helene, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Manufacturing Month. Okay, thank you. For the record, Helene Castletine, I'm the Economic Development Director with the Indian River County Chamber of Commerce, and thank you for joining us in recognizing the importance of manufacturing here in Indian River County. As I'm sure you realize, manufacturing is involved with just about every aspect of our daily lives, from the clothing we wear to the appliances and furniture in our homes. American, manufact American manufacturing is essential to our, <clears throat> to our economy. Nationally, Manufacturing Day spots spotlights manufacturers around the state and around the country. In Indian River County and in our tri-county region of Indian River, St. Lucie, and Martin counties, we celebrate our manufacturers all month long. Now, a lot of people still think of manufacturing as dark, dangerous factories designed for low-skill workers. Couldn't be further from the truth. Manufacturing Month addresses these misperceptions. Today's manufacturing environment is highly technical. It includes robotics, automated automated machinery, and screen technologies. And we want to let everyone in our area know how our manufacturers help drive our local economy. 
So in addition to the facts, the figures you heard from Commissioner O'Brien, here are a couple of other little fun facts you may not know. In our region, there are roughly 900 manufacturers on the Treasure Coast who employ almost 11,000 workers with an average annual wage of 60,850. And from 2015 to 2020, manufacturing employment actually grew 17% in our region. And the industry contributes 1.2 billion, that's billion with a B, to our gross regional product. So that's pretty significant. So to kick off our month-long tribute to all of our local manufacturers in the Tri-County region, the Treasure Coast Manufacturers Association is spotlighting 31 manufacturers, one each day, for the month of October. On Monday, Peridolia was featured. On Thursday, it'll be Piper Aircraft, and they'll be dispersed, interspersed throughout the month. We have about 10 or 11 local manufacturers that'll be on the TCMA Facebook page, so if you happen to go up there, now that it's back online again, um, if you happen to go on their Facebook page, I encourage you to do so and share it out with your friends. So as you probably do know, our region boasts a vibrant range, range of manufacturing, from airplanes to orange juice, from boats to beer, shutters to precision equipment, and so, so much more. So showcasing the diversity of our companies and the importance of what they do, we're thinking it may also spark an interest to our younger generation, maybe those who are in high school or just out of high school who may not know what career path to follow. Or perhaps those more experienced workers who maybe are looking for a career change. So long-term plans, we have other plans as a region. Um, we partnered with the economic developers in St. Lucie, Martin, and Okeechobee counties, Career Source Research Coast, and Indian River State College. We've contracted with WPTV, and over about the next 10 months into next summer, we'll be doing a lot of PSAs and promotion about the benefits of working or having careers in the manufacturing industry. So we're just in the early stages of, de of developing that, doing the creative right now, but I think we're looking to launch that probably the end of this month or in early November, so stay tuned. So thank you again for joining us in recognizing the importance of manufacturing here in Indian River County and throughout the Treasure Coast. So thank you. You want to introduce everybody? Yes, yes, we do. We have some friends with us. We have Carlo Cazio from Novarania. We have Lori Collings with Manpower. Lori is the chair of our Manufacturing Boot Camp Committee. We have Pete Anderson from Peridolia Brewing, Brewery in Sebastian. Dory Stone, the president of our Indian River Chamber of Commerce. And John Bowman with Piper Aircraft. So thank you again. Um, Helene, two things. One, um, Carlo, uh, tell us what you all do, because I think everybody else is kind of self-explanatory, but what, what, what does your company manufacture? Uh, Novarenia builds uh, tenders for super yachts, so in the range from 11 feet up to 38. So nowadays there are yachts that fit 38 footers in a garage, so that's yeah. what we make, the tenders to go in, the, in those mega yachts. So Very cool. Quality. Very cool. Um, and Lori, with Manpower, what, what's the job market for job seekers in manufacturing? <laughs> That's wide open. Uh, I find a lot of people who say they want to work, uh, hopefully they will actually go to work. <laughs> um, right now we are staffing and uh, filling a lot of manufacturing jobs and then everything that supports that. So just want to remind people too that it is getting more technical. People are getting degrees in um, PLC technology, all kinds of uh, circuitry, electronics, programming, and that all supports manufacturing. And it's only going to become more and more prevalent in our manufacturing industry. Very good. And John, I know last time I drove by, Piper was still hiring. Is that still correct? Yes, absolutely. There's uh, hiring in all areas, manufacturing, engineering, manufacturing, engineering, um, uh, you name it. Uh, yeah, the manufacturing, um, yeah, the production uh, right. operators. We have uh, in-house training, so you know we're hiring people that have the will and the the ability to learn. We'll teach them how to build airplanes. Uh, it'd be great to to get experienced people already, but uh, so 
becoming harder and harder to do that. So we're building in-house training programs. We have an apprenticeship program at Piper. We started a few years ago. So there's definitely a lot of opportunity at Piper. Awesome. And then, Pete, we spoke a little earlier. You you hosted the uh, Sebastian Chamber media auction last week, and you mentioned that you, you're really busy, so I take it that's a good sign for you as well. That's a great sign. Uh, after shutdowns with COVID, anybody that survived that I think can survive anything as a business. Uh, and as far as manufacturing in the brewing industry, uh, statewide, now there are over 400 breweries in Florida. Uh, I know USF St. Pete has a brewer's science uh, certificate that people can go for if they're interested in that. Nationwide, there are over 8,000 breweries. So if anybody out there is not sure what they want to do after school, there's a great way to, uh, to or a great place to go look if they're interested in the industry. It's, yeah. it's still growing. And, and I've always thought that uh, having the breweries like you all, and, and more than one, I think, is, is important. And I think you all get along well with, with other breweries, and everybody's kind of working for the common good. But it, it really seems to help attract that millennial um, population group because those are things they like to do is to go to different breweries and and try the different beers and so I think it's I think it's great for our community that we have now I don't know four or five six different options so I think that just helps our recruiting and and maybe retaining some of the younger kids to stick around and you know get a manufacturing job and then go to the local brewery after work you know so I think it all all ties together pretty good the breweries are more than the manufacturing side of things too like you said we do the charitable events right uh, there's marketing positions, sales positions. There's a lot of different things that are attached to any brewing operation. Yeah. So right. thank you for allowing us to be here. Yeah, well, thank you all for what you're doing, and uh, keep it up and good work. Thank you. And I, uh, I think that uh, I, realizing this is about manufacturing, but thank you for all you do in Sebastian. Uh, the events, you, you make that whole area rock some nights. And you, you do draw, as uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien uh, said, you know, you've, you've invited a younger group that wants to have a good time respectfully, and you provide that, that ingredient. So I appreciate that as a, as a collateral. And as far as when, when uh, we were talking about Novarena, uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien, I don't know uh, if you've ever been boarded, you haven't been boarded by the Sheriff's Office, but for many years, the sheriff's office sported uh, a beautiful Novarina uh, vessel, and uh, it was uh, very effective and uh, very uh, fast. So we, we wanted to. Yeah, you know, Mr. Chairman, I can honestly say I've never been boarded by our sheriff's boat. <laughs> Oh, you go now, down there, south? there may be other law enforcement boats have, have come aboard, but I can honestly say never has the Indian River County Sheriff's Sheriff's boat ever boarded my vessel. I'm sure it was just for a safety check. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just sure you had a fire extinguisher. Yep, had, the, had the whistle. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you all. Fine. Y'all come up for a photo? <laughs> John, thanks for Thank you. That's good. We have to have a little fun there. Thank you. How are you? Always pleasure. Thanks for coming down to the I said, you make a rock down there. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. Y'all take three or four steps to your right. Carla, Pete. Helene, come on down. There you go. That's better. Oh, no. I'm, I'm behind Pete. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right. Good. And, Helene, this is only a small portion of what is percolating out there. They're busy working. Producing products here in Indian River County. Thank you all again. Thank you. Next item is a presentation proclamation recognizing October 2021 as Vaping Awareness Month. And uh, Commissioner Susan Adams will uh, provide the honors. Thank you. Come on up, ladies. Thank you for being here. 
It's my pleasure to read a proclamation recognizing October 2021 as Vaping Awareness Month. Whereas the federal government has declared youth e-cigarette use or vaping a nationwide epidemic as vaping has increased dramatically across the country and in Florida. And whereas in 2020, the Florida Youth Tobacco Survey by the Florida Department of Health Bureau of Epidemiology revealed that 21.6% of high school students and 8.1% of middle school students used e-cigarettes. And whereas e-cigarettes are especially unsafe for kids, teens, and young adults due to their highly addictive nicotine content and developing young brains are more vulnerable to its effects, including reduced impulse control, deficits in attention and cognition, and mood disorders. And whereas e-cigarette aerosol is not harmless water vapor, and the aerosol that users breathe and exhale from these devices can contain harmful substances, including cancer-causing chemicals and heavy metals such as nickel, tin, and lead. And whereas the focus of October 2021 Vaping Awareness Month is to put accurate information about youth and adult e-cigarette use into the hands of our citizens, an important step to reversing this alarming trend in Indian River County. And whereas, Indian River County is advancing the goals and objectives of Vaping Awareness Month through a variety of public health activities, including town hall style presentations, vape free pledge drives at local middle and high schools, and other collaborative vape preven vaping prevention efforts between the school district and the Substance Awareness Center. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners in Denver River County, Florida, that October 2021 be recognized as Vaping Awareness Month in Indian River County, adopted this fifth day of October 2021 and signed by all five county commissioners. Welcome, ladies. It's a pleasure to have you here today, and I know you'd love the opportunity to give us a little update on what you have planned for the month, because I'm sure it's packed with activities. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Kylie Savoy and I'm the project director for the Quit Doc Foundation. I would really just on behalf of the Tobacco Free Partnership and our Safer SWAT youth just extend a big thank you to the County Commission for your continued support in this proclamation. You know, the number 21% is high, but it is a decrease from what we were seeing last year. And that is not only in part to the work of our partnership and our youth, but also to the work that you guys do to support our work. You know, whether it was ensuring that all our parks are tobacco and vape free or being the third county in the state to raise the age of purchase to 21, your work truly supports the work that we are doing in the community. Um, it is a jam packed month. You will see our youth and our partnership at the various community night out events being offered throughout the county. We also have Dr. Barry Hummel coming to speak on the vaping town hall on October 21st at 7 p.m. at the Elks Lodge and we would love to see you there. Um, before, again, I would just like to extend a thank you and also turn it over to Carrie Lester with the Substance Awareness Center to talk about what they are doing as well. Good morning. I am Carrie Lester, the Executive Director of the Substance Awareness Center. And I just want to take a moment both as a parent and as a prevention partner to thank you for the time and attention you've put on the vaping epidemic. Um, you have done an amazing job as leaders in shining a light on the dangers of vaping and the work that you have done to pass legislation to protect our youth from those dangers. And so I sincerely thank you for that work that you have done. There are so many pressing demands before us this, this day and age, but it's critical that we continue to shine that light on the dangers of vaping and this vaping epidemic. And so taking some time today, this proclamation and recognizing Vaping Awareness Month, month helps us do that. You know, our youth are vaping high content nicotine and high content THC. These are not benign substances. They, they are highly addictive chemicals that prime the brain for addiction. And so at the Substance Awareness Center, we stand by prevention works. We know we can protect that vulnerable developing adolescent brain from the harmful effects of substances. And so we partner with our school district to provide evidence-based substance abuse prevention curriculum to all middle school students. And there is vaping specific content in that curriculum. And for our kiddos in our community that have engaged in health risk behaviors such as vaping, we offer an indicated prevention program to target those health risk behaviors. 
And our agency is also home to our uh, substance abuse prevention coalition, SAFER, where we do work tirelessly with our community stakeholders to help reduce youth substance use in our community and keep our youth healthy and safe. And so I just really want to thank you for your support in keeping our youth healthy and safe in Indian River. Well, the address is uh, multi-pronged, and uh, you all have done an outstanding job uh, for uh, announcement of awareness and uh, involvement with the community, the schools, uh, and your local government. Uh, the, the address has come from many different directions, from the manufacturers not being able to uh, provide all these different flavors that we were seeing, and the enhancement, the advertising. Uh, then uh, I know uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien uh, wanted to up the ante on the age, and uh, we all agreed that that was the most appropriate thing to do. Uh, and uh, once again, I, I think we're seeing a lot less of the remnants of vaping. We're seeing a lot less of youthful individuals vaping, and uh, I guess the, the intention was to uh, allow people to uh, wean themselves from cigarettes, and uh, that would be the existence, but there's not a trend that's growing that people are embracing, young individuals embracing this harmless, because it's not harmless, substance. So uh, you're doing some great work, and I think uh, across the board, uh, we, we are going to see a tremendous change. I know I, I've seen a tremendous change already, but I think there could be even an elimination. So let's keep up the good work. Thank you. Prevention truly is a partnership, and it takes our whole community. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Would you like to come down and get a picture? Come on. We're not wearing heels. Thank you again, Thank ladies. You. Next item is the approval for the minutes for the regular meeting of July 6, 2021. So moved. Second. <clears throat> uh, motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Airman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. There is uh, informational items. Mr. Ready? Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like to highlight a few things on our uh, the venue, the Indian River County venue event calendar. Um, first up is tonight, August 6th, from 4 to 7 p.m. is the National Night Out, sponsored by the Indian River County Sheriff's Office. This will be at the IG Center at Wiggins Field from 4 to 7 p.m. And this is a great event to bring the, the kids out to. Um, there will be free food, face painting, canine demonstrations, um, uh, sheriff and fire vehicles and lights and sirens and horns, all kinds of fun stuff for the kids. And it's a great opportunity to come out and tell those first responders thank you for all they're doing for the community and to show your appreciation and just a, a good time um, out. So that's tonight tomorrow. from 4 to, pardon? Tomorrow night. The six, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. I thought it said Tuesday. I'm sorry. Tomorrow night. Yeah. Tomorrow night, October 6th at the IG Center uh, from 4 to 7. Um, then, dear to my heart, we have the Treasure Coast Marine Flea Market and Boat Show. That's this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, at the Indian River County Fairgrounds. We have a um, very, usually a very popular, uh, a free residential paper shredding event, October 16th at Secure Shredding, and that's on 3910 U.S. Highway 1, and that'll be from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. You just drive up, pop the trunk, they unload everything, you drive off, um, and it's all free to the, uh, to the residents. Um, the children's Halloween party at the main library, October 21st. Um, those of you that drive over the Barber Bridge heading east, and if you look to the north, you see all those islands there. Those are the Lost Tree Islands that the county with uh, the town of Inuit Shores and city of Vero Beach purchased for conservation, so those islands will never be developed. But we are having a public meeting on October 27th 
to um, take a first look at the um, management plan for those islands that the county staff is developing. And that'll be October 27th at the IG Center from 6 to 7.30. Um, for those of you with kids, there is a children's Halloween party. Um, so a lot going on here, just, uh, Mr. Chairman, but um, October 21st at the Main Library from 6 to 7, costume parade and games for kids and all ages. And uh, I believe, well, those are the highlights. There's a, a ton of stuff going on, so I just recommend you download the uh, uh, venue event calendar and take a look. There's something for everybody, free pickleball classes, all that good stuff. Um, but just lots going on in Indian River County. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it that you say be somewhere. That was like uh, Chris Bergman's, you know, yeah. fastest three minutes in sports. Yeah. Indy River County in three minutes. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Um, I, I would just like to second that motion on the children's uh, Halloween party, October 21st from 6 to 7 p.m. I spent time, uh, I had the opportunity to spend time last week at the main library, and that's in Vero Beach. And I was in the children's section, and not only is it beautiful, the place, I mean, it's bright, it's airy, uh, plenty of books, uh, computers, if the children want to use that, and this huge teddy bear, so, uh, so sweet. But I met, um, I met Heather um, Helton, who, who works there, a, a wonderful young lady who just, who loves children and is so enthusiastic. I'm sure that parents uh, would appreciate, you know, bringing their children to a party. Uh, there. It's not just the, the place, it's the people. So I'll, I'll point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Hearing nothing else, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I have 7B. I have the one other. Oh. Mr. Chair. You said that was it. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I meant on 7A. Excuse me. Okay. Um, as a 7B, um, I do have an appointee for planning and zoning, I'm happy to say. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Harry Howell, who uh, retired from that position, so I want to thank him for his service and announce that Mr. Mark Musher will be joining uh, planning and zoning uh, board as uh, the appointee for District 5. He comes with a long uh, history of service on the uh, P&Z Commission in uh, the city of Vero Beach. He was there almost 20 years he served, so he's, he's very knowledgeable in the area of planning and zoning. And he, uh, he also had a long and successful uh, career in business, and that was um, internationally. So he's well-versed in many issues, and I'm delighted that he will be uh, joining our Planning and Zoning Commission. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Now we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there anything that commissioners that would like to further discuss, review? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to discuss Polo 8F. Is that eight, right? 8F Foxtrot. Is there anything else? Is there any member of the uh, attending public that wishes to have anything pulled for further clarification, discussion, debate? Do we have anybody on the internet attending? Sure. Thank you. If there's nobody, if there's nothing else to be pulled, I'd be happy to move consent agenda as amended. Second. That's a motion by uh, Commissioner Adams, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. 8F Foxtrot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, I'd, I'd like to. Uh, uh, I got this uh, the other day when I looked at it, and this is to consider uh, consideration of notice of intent to sell from Paget Creek LLC and the county's first negotiation rights to acquire their property under the conservation easement. I would like to investigate this a, a little further and have staff look at it, maybe even entering a negotiation zone. I'm not necessarily mean we have to buy it at this time, but there's a lot going on out there. If you just saw I don't know if you y'all were able to see it, but uh, the uh, state of Florida is uh, doing the, the wildlife corridor out there. They they they're going to look at uh, buying all the conservation easements on Wedgeworth Farms and all that stuff, which is in the near vicinity of this area of of, of the uh, Paget Creek LLC. 
and, and I think it might be uh, worthwhile for us to look into it further, ask and see what the price is, maybe look at look at how it, where it is in conjunction with the state purchase to see if it fits in, to see if it's something that we can do instead of just kind of, no, we're not interested. And I understand the reasons uh, in the staff report being it's far out, but, but I, I just think it'd be our due diligence not to, not to not do anything or look into this further with regards to the uh, possible preservation or, 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 or maybe even purchase if the price is right uh, on this on this land and uh, maybe look at some other options. I, I, I just think it would be a little bit premature that we kind of just just let this go without without uh, further talking to the uh, people with Paget Creek LLC. So that would uh, I, I would like to hear if you all have any thoughts on that also. Yeah, one thing, um, Commissioner, Herman, I think I think maybe just Chairman Flesher and I were the only two on the board back then when we purchased this, but the the concept behind purchasing the conservation easement on the land is basically it, it strips the two, well two main things. One, it strips the land of any future uh, development. Um, I think I think in the easements there's allowance for like one more residence on 300 acres something minor like that you know a caretaker's house or, or something and secondly and most importantly um, we go out and do a baseline study of all the environmental aspects of that land and then as part of that conservation easement agreement the landowner is responsible for maintaining that land in the same or better condition as when we purchased the conservation easement um, and so I, I think those are the two biggest keys of this. And so regardless of who buys this um, on the market, they are going, that, that easement goes with the land. It, it's in perpetuity. So the new owner would have to, um, again, maintain the property in the same environmental condition as originally when we put, purchased the conservation easement. They're responsible for all the costs of the maintenance, pulling the weeds, killing the exotics, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so from my point of view, you know, I think we're protected. Um, you know, I've been out to, to the property since we purchased them, and they're, you know, you've got landowners that are stewards of the land, so they, they take care of it. Um, you know, another one we had was with the, uh, uh, the Sexton family. We purchased conservation easements uh, from them. And so... Um, I wouldn't want to delay the owner, you know, from moving forward um, unnecessarily. Um, I don't, I don't think we need to take any more time. But if you want to take a week and bring this back, you know, a week from now and talk to staff a little bit more, I would say that would be okay. But I don't think we want to sit here for a couple, three months and try to figure out what the state is going to do with the other properties and tie up, uh, you know, the, the potential sales. So. That's just kind of where I'm sitting is I think we're well protected on these. Um, we don't have to spend a penny maintaining them and they're, they're preserved and protected, which was our intent when we bought the conservation easement. So from my point of view, I think, you know, we don't need to spend more money on it. Um, cause we did spend, I mean, the, again, cause we stripped the development value off. That was the value of the land. So we paid and I, I maybe Jason remembers, I, I don't recall the cost, but it, it was a, it was a significant purchase, let's just say. So we've invested a lot of money to protect those lands, and that protection runs with the land regardless of a sale. So, again, if, you know, if you want to take a week to get a little bit more information, I'd be okay with that. But I wouldn't want to tie this up for months. No, and that's not my intention either. I think my, my intention for this is to, I, I, is to look at this uh, with regards to have we checked all the beneficial aspects of it. The fact with the the Florida corridor coming in that part of the county, is it adjacent to? Is it is it is it you know in the wrong spot? Is it in the right spot? Just some, I think there's just some things we need to iron out. And no, I don't want to hold up the sale if we're not going to if, if you know if the price isn't like tremendous where it would be make sense for us to purchase it. But and I'm not promoting that we do purchase it this time. But I, I think there's a few more things we should look at before we kind of blow this off a little bit. I think in regards to uh, what we need to do. So. You, know, you know, when we were uh, discussing this many years ago, uh, I wasn't that fond of, of purchasing 
the uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien will recall I wasn't too fond of uh, extinguishing the rights and and uh, having them in, in in our hands and it, it was uh, I, I thought it was a little bit uh, too strong of protectionism uh, but in hindsight it was brilliant it's transferable it's in perpetuity and the agreement exists and it is still in the in the best interest of the citizens of the residents of the people who count not uh, any private uh, firm that may, may want to do something different if the property is transferred again and again those those uh, rights are extinguished in perpetuity so I don't know what the danger is uh, but uh, I'm in agreement too if if you want to hold it for a week uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what, what I would like to do is, is uh, I guess my, we'll have some further discussion, but my motion would be let's let's have staff look into this further uh, just to make sure that, that, that all our, our, our I's are dotted and T's are crossed and how it conforms with the Florida corridor purchase and all that sort of stuff, just, 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 to, just to see where, where we're at on this. I just don't want to, I don't want to really move on this. You know, like today, I'd like to give it a week or maybe two weeks, however long it takes staff to talk with, with Paget Creek LLC and, and check in with the other parties involved in land purchases, other, especially the state. I, I just want to note that under the agreement, we have a 30-day time frame. Um, and so we got notice of this, unfortunately, on September 17th, which kind of left us not really able to move forward in September, but now leaves us with making a decision by either this meeting or the next meeting on the 12th. Yeah, could we have some next meeting? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to, and we will certainly research the issues I've heard of looking at the Florida corridor. Is there anything else as part of your direct, the board's direction that you would like staff to analyze between now and next meeting? I just have a question. I don't know if it's something that needs to be analyzed, but for clarification purposes, what can happen under a conservation easement and what cannot happen under a conservation easement because i think that understanding what you can do with a property and what you cannot do with a property if it has a conservation easement in perpetuity on it would be helpful to the public and to the commissioners and if you don't know right now that's fine we can talk about it next week yeah, I mean, there's an extensive uh, grantor's reserved rights section in Article 5 that sets forth the different things. Uh, I'd be happy to further kind of go dive deeper into that. It's kind of a lengthy section. Uh, as noted, I think, earlier today, um, it does state that any purchaser or transferee takes title to the fee encumbered by this conservation easement. So as noted, that will continue to remain even with a transfer. Um, but certainly would be happy to kind of dive in further as we go into the next meeting and explaining all the different types of restrictions yeah. under the easement. I think we just haven't talked about conservation easements in a while. We haven't had one in front of us. We haven't had to necessarily deal with it. So um, people forget how restrictive it can be. Um, and while the property is changing hands, it's very limited in scope with what you can do with that property. And it typically falls along the lines of, you know, traditional kind of agricultural or running cattle, um, that type of thing. So I just think it's worth as part of the conversation to refresh everybody's memory on what that means, especially in light of conservation um, being a hot topic um, as development ramps up in the, in the state in, as a whole. Um, yes, and I, w I would appreciate that as well. Um, thank you to uh, Commissioner Ehrman for, for raising the issue. Um, I had looked at the deed, um, Article 5, uh, Sections H1 and 2. And in H1 uh, states that uh, the right to subdivide uh, these two residential parcel uh, parcels, excuse me, into two new tax parcels. Um, when we're going to uh, examine it, in detail, I'd appreciate an explanation, especially of those two sections uh, next week. Sure, we'd be Thank happy you. to do so. 
I, I will tell you, I think when we negotiated these, that was the intent was for family members that wish to remain with the land. Uh, remember, I think Whoa. this parcel is like 330 something acres. So we, we did allow for up to two more residences for family members to live on the land, to run the land. You know, a lot of these, the, the Sexton, Sextons, the Adams, you know, they're all kind of family run and, and things like that. So, um, that, and, and Dylan can explain more next week, but that's where that came from is just to allow, if a family member wishes to stay on the land, they can build a, a second residence. So, um, and I think that's a really good point, um, Commissioner O'Brien, because what has what traditionally happens is most of these large properties are held by family members, and as generations, um, younger generations, they split apart. Um, you know, it starts with your grandfather, then you have the siblings, and then you have the grandkids, and then the great grandkids, and that pyramid gets bigger, um, and it's very difficult to make a living in ag. It's very hard work. Um, and, and some of the family members don't necessarily want to do that. They'll, they'll find a different career. But in order to help facilitate these properties remaining as, as working um, ranches or working agribusinesses, having the ability to have multiple, family gener multiple families and multiple generations of one family or one group, um, staying on the land or having your superintendent or your farm manager, your ranch manager, and their family staying there, especially when some of these are located so far away from urban areas, is very important. And I know um, I know that has been the intention, at least in conservation easements I've, I've dealt with. But I do think, again, it's just it would be good to refresh our memories on how these work, what can happen, what can't happen. So there's a... a an understanding of how much protection really is afforded through a conservation easement. And that, commissioners, I've, I've read, uh, you know, I've read all the requirements on conservation and and and, and uh, development easements and all that sort of stuff. And, and I've got no issue. I've got really no issue with this. I just want to make sure we haven't leave any stone unturned how it how it fits in maybe again with the with the with the Florida corridor purchase. Uh, with some other th other things, and even I think we should exercise our right at least to ask Paget LLC how much do you want for the property? You know, and, I mean, and we can say no, we're we're not interested. But I think I think those are some just important information that that we need and and to figure out. So with that, that that would be my motion to have the county attorney's office look into this a little bit further. Come back next meeting with just uh, an explanation of some of those. Now, second it. And, and and just to, to answer Commissioner O'Brien's question on the on the dollar amount, it looks like we paid about six point three million for the Paget Creek um, property, and about five million for the Triple S. Uh, so so we've got a little over ten million in those development rights. So they are a thing of value, and and not to belabor it, and we'll go into it more next week. But the you're you're paying for the 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 value of developing that into a higher intensity and what's left behind is what it's used for right now essentially which is you know running cattle and things like that so there's a differential in the total fee interest amount but uh, a large portion of the value of that property is is of was determined to be um those development rights in, in the future so the three things i heard as i'm going to explore a little bit further dive into a little bit more about the florida uh, acquisition uh, dive in a little bit better uh, explanation about the easement rights and see if I can uh, get any information from the seller or buyer on what kind of potential price range we would be looking at and kind of bring that back to the board uh, next week for discussion. Right. And also just make sure, like I think like Commissioner Abbs said, let's just make sure that everybody's clear on the, on the whatever, what, what rights are not out there, whether it's developmental, you know, co conservation and or both or, you know. That. Yeah. And that was part of kind of the easement rights, right. kind of further discussion of that. That's all, that's all I would ask. So I'm Thank done, you. Mr. Chairman. That's my motion. Upon motion by Commissioner Airman, seconded by Commissioner Walsh. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously, and we'll see this next week. Next item is a public discussion item, a request to speak by Paul Westcott uh, regarding the potential vaccination mandate and he's got some attachments and we are having them distributed and here is Councillor Paul Westcott.
Good morning. Um, this is uh, hopefully not intending to, to borrow tomorrow's troubles necessarily, but uh, being an Eagle Scout, I like to be prepared. And, and with uh, what the Biden administration is, is, uh, is uh, discussing, uh, I am concerned is going to find its way here, and that is some form of uh, vaccination mandate. Um, my comments are not intended to be anti-vaccination. Um, it's really directed toward personal uh, decision making. Uh, it's a liberty issue. And specifically, um, there are many good reasons for individuals, be it religious, personal health, the contraindications as to why they might not take a vaccination. Uh, additionally, there's one that's even more subtle. Um, we're told that the vaccination will um, not necessarily prevent someone from getting the disease, but will assist in mitigating the symptoms. Um, a friend of mine in West Palm recently uh, had been vaccinated, very uh, conscientious person, um, unwittingly uh, carried the COVID disease to work with him, to his office, his employees, one of whom is uh, at risk, another happens to be a family member I know. And the vaccine, vaccination worked for him mitigated the symptoms, so much so that it was ambiguous about whether or not he had the disease, okay? Um, I, I bring this point up just to give you context as to there are various reasons why uh, your constituents, your employees might not want to take the vaccine. And they're good ones, they're personal ones. And I appreciate the position that you all, as I understand it, have taken thus far, and that is that, that you're going to let your employees make that personal choice. My concern for our community is as we approach next November with a gubernatorial race, with an administration that seems to be bent on forcing this topic, it's going to become uh, a topic of increasing pressure for you all. That, that you all are going to have to uh, probably deal with this. So uh, it's something I've thought about in, in a number of ways, uh, others who have approached me. And uh, there are many reasons why you would not want to force this, uh, to, to succumb to the pressures of the federal government and, and mandate vaccinations. The first one is found in our Constitution, the state Constitution, Article 1, Section 23, provides that every natural person has the right to be left alone and free from government intrusion into the person's private life except as otherwise provided herein. And that's been interpreted, you'll see that in my letter, that's been interpreted to apply to personal health decisions that would include uh, vaccination choices, okay? Um, so it, it would seem that our state constitution gives our uh, government em employees protection from being forced to have a vaccination. Uh, secondly, uh, and I'll read from the Supreme Court op opinion, we conclude that a competent person has the constitutional right to choose or refuse medical treatment, and that right extends to all relevant decisions concerning one's health. That being the case, um, an individual has the right to choose whether or not to be vaccinated. And I think that's an important uh, thing for you all to remember as this pressure comes to bear. What I'm hoping to do is I'll leave you all with reasons why you, you need to push back uh, at the coming pressure. The additional one uh, is Section 381.0036, Florida Statutes. Uh, that's been in the news lately. That's the one that uh, Governor DeSantis has mentioned as a basis for a $5,000 per person fine. The way that statute's constructed, however, um, you'll see in my letter, I think there's an argument that that is a personal right to be free from this intrusion as well. Okay, so we have a constitutional provision and this statutory provision that might give an individual personal protection from being forced to have a vaccination and having sanctions because they choose not to be vaccinated. Well, why is that? That's particularly relevant when you're going to hear from the federal government that you're going to be fined in a particular way if you don't vaccinate. Well, there's some costs that you're going to experience if you take action the way the federal government wants because one might argue that the state constitution and these statutes give a private right to sue for a wrongful termination. In other words, if you terminate somebody and it's violative of state constitution or state statute, that by definition might be a wrongful termination. 
So there's some costs out there that you all need to consider as these pressures do come to bear. And that's the intention of my letter, is to bring these to your attention. Additionally, there are the workers' compensation components. If you mandate a vaccination, you have now taken on the responsibility for any and all side effects that go with that, and that will be forced into your workers' compensation program. Um, there is a stat to your statute of limitations attached uh, that comes along with your workers' compensation exposure. However, to the extent these the, stat, the, the vaccinations are still very new. We don't know the extent to which there are going to be complications. So that two-year window may actually be extended because there's some uh, case law that interprets it to be when the injured worker should or uh, knew or should have known they were injured by, in this case, the vaccination. So the tail, if you will, of this liability is unknown. And from a risk management perspective for you all, it's going to be difficult to reserve for it. It's another complication that you need to consider in terms of if this does find its way to your doorstep. And then uh, the, the final element is the Americans with Disability Act. Um, if somebody has a pre-existing condition that's covered on the Americans with Disabilities Act that their doctor tells them to avoid being vaccinated, um, that is not probably, getting vaccinated is probably not an essential function of that job, their job description. Therefore, um, I'm not sure that there's an accommodation other than not requiring that person to be vaccinated that you can offer that would avoid you, your violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I mentioned these things to you just so that you're prepared, you're in really good hands uh, with Mr. Reingold. I, I've, I've worked with him in the past uh, uh, when I handled your workers' compensation program uh, litigation. Um, but I just want to bring these to your attention in the event, as the political climate in our state changes, as the Biden administration does what they, they have told us they intend to do, um, you're, you're better prepared. And I appreciate your time and I appreciate your work that you guys do. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Next item on the agenda, County Administrative Matters, uh, which is the Indian River County, St. Lucie, Martin County Joint Board Meeting. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to turn this item over to, into the capable hands of uh, Kathleen Keenan for her presentation. Hi, good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Kathleen Keenan, Legislative Affairs and Communications Manager. Um, in preparation for the 2022 Florida Legislative Session, Martin County and St. Lucie County have reached out to Indian River to see if the board would be interested in attending a joint meeting to discuss legislative priorities for the coming year. Um, the meeting is tentatively set for Tuesday, October 26th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Indian River State College Main Campus in Fort Pierce. In accordance with section 125.001 Florida statutes, the board is permitted to participate in a joint meeting with the governing bodies of one or more adjacent counties or municipalities to discuss matters relating to land development, economic development, or any other matters of mutual interest. To do so, all three reference counties are required to adopt a resolution authorizing the participation of the joint meeting, publicly notice the meeting, and hold the meeting in an appropriate public place. Um, so staff recommends the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners adopt the proposed resolution to hold a joint meeting with the Board of County Commissioners for St. Lucie and Martin Counties to discuss joint le legislative priorities in anticipation of the state of Florida's 2022 legislative session. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions of Kathleen? Move staff recommendation. Second. It's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item is a, from Public Works, which is the Native Garden Configuration at the County Administration Building A. And we see Rich Spirica. Commissioners, good morning. Rich Spirica, Public Works Director. Got a couple of, there we go. So we're back before you today. Um, Dr. Baker and I have been back and forth a couple of times, but we've got a layout that we believe meets the board's expectations that, and that we are comfortable with as far as staff's concerned. 
So with board direction on the 17th to bring that this back to you, I now present you with what I believe is the final proposed design for the native garden out front of building A. And I can answer any question. Oh, it's been brought back to the original vision, yes, the original proposal. And uh, they added the five feet that we needed for maintenance. Right. Um, they removed the tables and put, they got a bench there, which um, we're okay with. Um, my staff has looked at the plantings that they're proposing. We don't really see any, my guys don't see any real issue with it. Um, I bring it for you today so you could, if you, if you choose or act favorably on this, this will allow Dr. Baker and his team to move forward with the final design and we can, we can uh, take care of some of the construction, constructability issues that are still outstanding. And this will also allow Dylan to move forward and put an agreement together based on what we now have as a, as a final proposed design. Maintenance wise, you're good with this? Excuse me? Maintenance wise? Yes, sir. We're, we're fine. I gave it to my staff who do the landscaping around here and take care of everything. They were okay with it. They don't see it as a major issue. It will take more weeding things like that, but they're comfortable with it. Rich, one thing, what happens to the existing irrigation? Is it is it capped, re-diverted? We'll, we'll cap it in case this doesn't, it, this doesn't sustain. We'll just cap the irrigation so that if we need it again, we will be able to use it. Plus they're gonna need to use the irrigation a little bit to keep it, you know, to get it moving and get it to grow. So we're fine with that. Staff's already, staff knows where the irrigation is out there, so it's not gonna be a big deal. I understand, we have, we have to move forward and give it ample time to, for the workability and environmental adjustment. Uh, but the, uh, and Dr. Baker has indicated that uh, if, if there is a, a, a change or recovery that uh, they would be perfectly willing to uh, accommodate that as well. That's why I asked about the, uh, the sprinkler. But uh, if, after looking at this proposed plan and uh, seeing uh, the, the, the tightness and, and direction that's been, been given, uh, it could be a tremendous asset by the same token. Yes, sir. Anything? I'm good. Yeah. I, just, I would just like to thank you uh, Rich, for your work on this, and uh, I, I know you know about it too, um, and you're, you're literally in your own backyard, so, uh, you know, I, I know that this is, uh, this, this project is in really good hands, and thank you for your work with it. If there aren't any further comments, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I did have one question here. I'm looking real quick. Um, I see there's Kunti in here, um, which I believe is uh, the larval monarch butterflies use. Is that correct? I don't see any milkweed. And I think milkweed is one of their plants that the larvae um, feed on. So there are no, maybe a question for Dr. Baker. Is there a reason why there's no milkweed in here? Hmm. I will. I will answer that question and okay. Dr. Baker if he wants to. Uh, milkweed's a little bit tough to grow uh, and I'll be honest with you. I grow <laughs> it's all over my yard. <laughs> yeah I know but when the butterflies take care of it or the aphids get to it. I mean my wife and I raise, well my wife mostly raises butterflies so I've right. got milkweed all over the place. It, it's a finicky plant. I, I would be concerned with planting it out here if it gets eaten up or it gets lots of aphids, the aphids transfer to other plants and I'd be concerned with it, but I'll be more than happy to let Dr. Baker. But then the other question, is there another larval plant um, here? For monarchs? Yeah. No, I wish there was, because then I wouldn't have so much milkweed in my yard. Um, yeah, we have not found, we have not been able to find another plant that milkweeds are with that, that monarchs will lay their eggs and the caterpillars will eat. Okay. So. I would love to plant a bunch of milkweed out here and, and bring the butterflies in, um, but I think it would be hard to sustain because it is susceptible. Yeah, and, and I agree in my yard, it's, you know, it looks really great, and then a week later it's just totally, you know, devastated, so. But, uh, 
Um, okay, that was my only question. Can we put pineapple plants in there? <laughs> yeah. That would give you something to do. No, I might lose my ag exemption if I give up any pineapple plants. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further? On motion by Commissioner Moore, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. Next item is in the utility services, and we're looking at the utility accounts receivable, bad debt to follow up, and potential foreclosure activity. And here's our team. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Cindy Carrenti, utility finance manager. Um, I've heard the subject uh, several times over the past year, but um, I'm here now to excitedly uh, present a summary of the progress we've made on our uh, bad debt in the utility department and um, our path going forward. So um, last October, between last October and December, staff had presented the BCC with uh, several details regarding our utility bad debt, and we offered some suggestions as to how to settle that debt. There was a series of presentations at those various meetings um, where together we refined the suggestions and um, came up with a path for a policy going forward. In March of this year, a public hearing was held that resulted in some modifications to county code. Um, those modifications set forth a 90-day window during which time customers could settle their bad debt in return for the utility writing off some or all of the accrued penalties and interest on their accounts. And uh, those modifications included an option to settle the discounted debt over a period of one year for others that um, financially couldn't quite make uh, ends meet during that 90-day window. Uh, immediately following the board meeting, we had ready to go uh, approximately 410 certified letters. So we got those in the mail right away to customers so they could receive notification um, directly in regards to this program that we had set forth. And then between March 9th and June 14th, we worked with customers to settle their bad debt or make those payment arrangements. So um, out of the, when we first presented, we did do the 410 letters, but we, when we presented the final back in December before the series of um, things leading up to the public hearing, we actually had 333 accounts in the group. Um, we included others that were getting close to the 24 month. There's some language in the code now about 24 months of past due expenses. So thus the 410. But um, to summarize, we had 333 accounts with a total of 2.881 million in uh, total debt. The principal or service availability charge, so that means the original loan or our service monthly service availability charge on that 2.881 million amounted to $928,000. The remaining 1,953,000 was all penalties and interest. So um, you can see that over time, and a lot of these debts were approaching the 20 year mark, um, but over time, obviously you can accrue quite significant penalties and interest. So we wanted to encourage folks to settle these things, get this stuff off of our books, and uh, move forward. So out of those 159, um, uh, out of 333 accounts, 159 were water and sewer accounts, which uh, amounted to uh, just over two million of that total in outstanding debt. We, um, we're able to settle 48 of those accounts. And um, the total cash collected out of that settlement was almost 121,000. And we wrote off over 483,000 in, um, in that bad debt. 
And I did have, I wanted to show you um, some numbers. So there was, there was one that, uh, one account in particular that owed us over $36,000. But when we got all said and done, we wrote off 28,000 in bad debt. So when you owe somebody 36,000 and you settle for about eight, hopefully the customer was happy. And I can tell you, I worked directly with all of the customers that were involved with this project. And there were some people that were absolutely relieved and thrilled to be able to finally come to terms with this um, debt that they had. When, it, when they were looking at 36,000, they couldn't even think about you know, starting to make payments or do anything reasonably. And once we showed them the numbers in black and white and what they could do, they were actually thrilled. So I was happy to work with these customers. And like I said, 48 of the water and sewer account customers um, settled their debt. The impact fee loans, of course, there weren't as many. We had 14 of those accounts. Um, five of those people settled their debt. So for the total outstanding debt of 95,000, we collected just over 22,000 in um, cash and waived about 19,000. So again, some more success stories. One of those was um, someone's debt had amounted to $2,400. This was on an original water impact fee loan that was 1,300. They hadn't made any payments on it. Um, so they settled for the 1,300. We wrote off the 1,100. They ended up tying in finally to the county water that they had intended to tie into years ago when they purchased that impact fee. And so now we have an active and successful customer amongst us. The assessments, uh, we had 159 assessment accounts that uh, encompassed 649,000 in total outstanding debt. We settled 54 of those accounts and collected just under $128,000 and waived almost 80,000. Um, just another couple examples for you. Uh, there was one person that their a settlement had ended up because of penalties and interest, ended up at um, $26,000 in debt, and they were able to settle that for $10,000. There was another person that owed us $1,800, but they settled for half, which was $900. So that's, that was the original assessment plus 10% um, fee. So again, some more success stories. Um, some old assessment accounts finally settled so that now those folks have paid equivalent to what their neighbors had paid for the availability of that service in their neighborhood. So then we did, um, as I had mentioned earlier, allow for um, payment arrangements. And so we made 22 payment arrangements. These folks um, have until next May to settle their debt. Uh, most of them are, well, some of them are paying Monthly, those that aren't are uh, receiving phone calls from uh, my staff or myself, encouraging them to continue to make payments. Some have um, struggled a little bit, but they've at least been making some payments. So we're continuing to try to work with those folks, accommodating their budgets as best we can, and still achieve what our ultimate long run um, goal was, was just to settle these debts. And there's the numbers. There were um, 22 arrangements made, 13 were on those water and sewer accounts, and nine were on the assessment accounts. So now we're at the next steps, um, sort of final steps, but um, there will be continued negotiations. So now we'll be working with our county attorney's office or outside counsel, um, if you so approve today, to process any potential foreclosures. Um, but I do want to emphasize this still is not the end of the road for these folks. When we go through the foreclosure process, there is still an opportunity to tho for those to uh, work out settlements with us. And that's absolutely our long-term goal. Our long-term goal is not to foreclose. Unfortunately, sometimes you need a final uh, step in the process. But again, um, we're gonna to try to work with these folks when they receive notice. Uh, personally, I'm hoping, I, you know, the first certified letters that went out the first time, the 410, those were under my name as utility finance manager. 
<laughs> so, you know, some folks are like, oh, well, whatever. You know, I've dealt with her before, big deal. Um, so I'm hoping, again, when these uh, foreclosure notices go out and they come on an attorney letterhead, maybe a few more folks who pay a little more attention than they did the first time around. And again, we'll work with them, negotiate payment terms if necessary, but ultimately and hopefully work out some settlements to continue to settle these, the remaining of these 410 accounts. Do I have any questions from any of you? <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know, maybe Commissioner Ehrman would like to have his name on those letters going out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll be happy to, to let you do that. <laughs> I, I remember the first year I was on the Value Adjustment Board and we had like, I don't know, a, a thousand rejections. And because I was the chair of the VAB or something, anyway, my name was on that letter that went out and said, sorry, we rejected you. So it's, it's just part of the process, Commissioner. <laughs> um, Cindy, I do have a couple things. One, thank you for your efforts on these collections um, and all the staff with the Utilities Department. I think we're, we're making really good progress. One question, um, we went from 333 to 410s. So we had 77 new cases, and maybe some of those 333 were, were recent also. Would any of them um, be eligible for COVID relief funds? I mean, do you have any way of tracking that, particularly the, the most recent 77, are they not paying because they lost their jobs from COVID and would they be eligible for any COVID relief to help them, you know, come bring that account current? Most of those just um, clicked into the next notch. A few of those were in code now, we have the 24 month guidelines so that we don't wait 20 years or 17 right, years right. to start working with these folks. So a few of those had clicked that. Um, I'm not aware of any that I've personally been able to speak to were in that situation. Um, there were others that we discovered were nearing the, especially on an impact fee loan, a, a five-year deadline and they hadn't made their payments or were not doing a good job making their payments. So we, um, you know, set those letters out. I will take another look at those. I have the <laughs> by account number, by name, by current account holder, because sometimes the original account holder that was on the assessment is no longer the person that owns that property. That was very right. common in this project. Um, but I will take another look at those others and um, look for that in particularly and make sure I explore that carefully. And uh, obviously, if I find any that are that, I will reach out before we reach out with an attorney's letter right, for foreclosure. Right. Okay, great, Use thank you. Follow up. And again, thank you for, for your efforts on this. I think you are making good progress on it. So. Thank you, you're welcome for the efforts. And um, I thank my staff, the utility staff for their efforts on the front end. And uh, it was a group effort and I think we made a lot of progress so far. Okay. Thank you, anything else? Mr. Chairman, I'll go ahead and move staff recommendation, which is to write off the, the bad debt ex expense, um, director of management budget to process a budget amendment and authorize the staff to work with county office, county attorney's office on potential foreclosures and to seek outside counsel if needed to assist with those foreclosures. Second. Second. We can grant that. That's a uh, motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Ehrman. Any further discussion? And your name on the letters too, by the way. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I just discovered why I, I've been designated at the Value Adjustment Board for oh, yeah. many years. Yeah. All those rejection letters have your name on them. Expect that phone to start ringing. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Commissioners. Appreciate the support. <laughs> Okay, well, the next item is uh, Commissioner O'Brien's item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it was at the last meeting when we were talking about the Lagoon Management Plan, I brought up the idea of a no discharge zone and um, uh, talked to the board about whether we should make this an issue with our joint meeting with Martin and St. Lucie County and things like that. Um, in doing some work on it, uh, you'll see in your backup a email from Janet Zimmerman with Florida Inland Navigation District. And one of those things where the state has actually done something that I really think is in their purview to do and makes sense from a statewide um, issue is that the legislature did pass a bill that says upon approval 
of the United States Environmental Protection Agency um, that uh, of a no discharge zone for the waters of the U.S. within the boundaries of any aquatic preserves in the waters of the state of Florida, such areas will be designated as, as a no discharge zone. So I think this is a great step forward for us. Um, in Indian River County, pretty much the entire county is encompassed within two different aquatic preserves. So from our county point of view, if this goes forward, we will um, certainly have that protection. And then um, I think I, I would still like us to have this as a topic on the, uh, the joint county meeting, tri-county meeting, because I think in other parts of the lagoon, they, they may have aquatic preserves, but it might not, might not be the entire section of the lagoon, which I think we want to work towards. Um, so I, I thought this was really good news. The state really did something I think is a benefit, and in, in my mind, this is a state-level thing that they should do. You know, they should say, yeah, all the state aquatic preserves should be no discharge. So um, I'm very happy this came forward. The only um, little bit of a, a, a little rain on the parade is that um, Kathleen um, Keenan, our uh, communications manager, um, checked with the DEP uh, contact and they're, they're still kind of organizing how they're going to do the application. So it's going to be a little bit of time, um, I think, before they get all their ducks in a row and can submit the application to EPA and then a, a review process. But um, we did offer uh, any help that we could provide, either letters of support, um, uh, and it may be something. Um, Jason, you said you're bringing our legislative priorities back next week. so. This might be something we add to our legislative priorities to have our lobby team work with DEP to kind of keep them moving on this and keep it going forward. Um, and the Clean Water Coalition, uh, I've been talking to them, and they've already, in anticipation of this, we're working on this, they developed a list of the um, uh, pump-out facilities in Indian River County, which is a, is a step forward. Um, so I, I think a lot of things moving forward, it's just going to take a little time for all this to get together. Um, but I, I think if we keep working with DEP and help them with the application, we can help move this forward and all that. So uh, I'm not asking any action by the board at this particular time. Just wanted to update you that there actually was some good news on this uh, situation. Yeah. Thank you. Jason did yeah, and we'd be happy to include that in the legislative priorities, which will either come next week or the following week um, before the board. And whereas we don't necessarily need legislation here, I don't think we frequently have our, our, our lobbyist group help us out with, with, with working with agencies. So, so um, we'd be happy to, to include that in our, right. in our Good, legislative policies. And that's all, Mr. Chairman. It's just, a, just an update. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Seeing no action. Uh, but we will be ready for action if necessary. Uh, we'll move on to the Solid Waste Disposal District, and we have a request for the general funds for the PACE project and other community projects for fiscal year 2021-2022. Uh, move staff recommendation. Second. As Amanchu is queuing up, so that's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Great presentation. Uh, next item is a work order, number 43, to Kimberly Horn for the Solid Waste Disposal District Annual Financial Reports. New staff recommendation. Second. Well, it's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Ehrman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, if I may, while Humacho is here, if I, I just have one quick question for him. We just finished at two for two. I know. He, he's doing good. Um, uh, earlier today, I brought up the fact we had the residential uh, paper shredding event coming up. Yeah. I know in the past that waste management has helped cover the cost of that. Are they doing that this year as well? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, and it's like, what, 6000 or 3600 or something? Uh, we have 16000 per year, I think, with an MOU, and so I think it's uh, got a split between two events. Okay, so about 8000 And so I just bring that up, Mr. Chairman, because yeah. I'm the first to give them a hard time when they screw up, but I think I'm also the first to commend them when they do something for the community like this. So I just want to put that out. 
that, that was actually a spoiler alert that'll be on our agenda next week. Oh. <laughs> but you know, now you know it's, it's, it's fully funded, paid for, <laughs> and hosted. Thank you. Anything further? No further for the greater good. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>